The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. So, hello again. Um, I just, I don't know if I introduced myself uh, enough. My, I want to introduce myself again. I don't know. It's one of those things. I feel like such a stranger. Um, my name is Father Mike Schmitz. I am a priest from the Diocese of Duluth in Minnesota, and I'm the director of youth ministry up there, as well as um, the, the chaplain at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And so, and so it's one of those things where when I'm, when my students are away, they're on spring break right now, which is why I'm able to be here right now, because this is my this is my spring break. I get to come south to sunny, sunny Texas. Um, <laughs> but I was really excited. You know, I love, I love campus work because I love where I live. The re- my residence is, is kind of, it's also the Newman Center. And so there's students always, always there. And I love them being there a lot. It's just, it's fantastic. But I also really, really like when they're gone. You know, this guy, if, you have, if you have kids or you ever had kids in your house, you know, this the thing. It's like you love having your kids. You love having grandkids. You love having kids in your house. But it just means some things. It just means you can't have nice things. You know, so, so when, they're, when, they're, when they're there, in session, when school's in session, now like all the nice, they go away. But when there's break, when it's spring break, when it's Christmas break, summer break, then I get to take out like the nice stuff and put it out. You know, I have this coffee table. And while students are there, the coffee table is bare. I mean, there's nothing on the coffee table, but they leave and I get to put stuff on my coffee table. I've got coffee table books that have been waiting to be on display. And it's an, inter- it's an interesting thing about coffee tables is a lot of times we use coffee tables to kind of tell other people about ourselves, right? Like you ever find yourself doing this where you, you put stuff on your coffee table because it says something about you. And so that's what I, I mean, that's what, maybe you're like, I have no idea. What you, like this is what I, this is what I do. Like, When it comes time for here's a break, I get to put stuff out. I've got my, you know, John Paul II coffee table book because, you know, I'm like into church or whatever. Um, Or I've got my Tour de France coffee table book because I'm sporty. And I've got my Far Side Anthology coffee table book because I've got a sense of humor, or at least I think I do. Um, And I want to say this very clearly. I've got my DC Comics Encyclopedia. It's leather bound and it's wonderful and it's beautiful. And it goes back on the shelf when the bishop comes over. it's one of those, and you know, that goes back on the shelf, the Bible comes back out, like, no, Bishop, welcome. Because we do this, right? We have this thing where we emphasize certain parts of us, emphasize, put things on our coffee table, depending on who we know is coming over. I mean, we, I even do this with my name. My last name is Schmitz, and so in September, October, I emphasize I am German during Oktoberfest. Like, I am so German, it's ridiculous, you know? But come tomorrow, St. Patrick's Day, I'm like, yeah, but the Schmitz married an O'Reilly, so I'm Irish, you know? We do this to emphasize certain things. You know, so here's the thing. We have a life like this. Our life is like a coffee table where we, on, our, on our coffee table, in our life, we have all this stuff that we're interested in, all this stuff we're into. So on your coffee table of your life, you probably have, like, you know, you have your family and your work and your church and your hobbies and your friends and your spare time, all these kind of things. And that's, that's who we are. That's what we're all about. And it's all there, and it's probably all really good. It, I'm guessing that everything you have on your coffee table is probably just a, it's a good thing. And even 
bonus, there's God. So go you. You know, this, this, this thing of like, no, I've got my family, I've got church, I've got, you know, um, my work, I've got my hobbies, I've got my friends, I've got it all. And God's part of that. And that's wonderful. The problem is this. The problem is when Jesus is there, but he's just a part of it. When Jesus is there, he's on my coffee table, he's in my life, but he's just a part of my life. And I sometimes emphasize him when it's convenient, and sometimes it's really easy to de-emphasize him when it's convenient. And sometimes we live these lives where you might call it, like we have like what you might call coffee table Christianity, or become like coffee table Catholics, where Jesus is there, but he's just another part of our life. He's just another, just another part of our coffee table. You know, I was thinking about this because I was reading just, you know, it seems like the people in the Gospels who meet Jesus, it seems like very, very few of them have coffee table Christianity. I imagine, you remember the story of the woman caught in adultery? Right? So she gets caught in the very act of adultery. These guys take her to the center of the city, and they're going to stone her. And Jesus steps in, and he saves her life. Imagine if you're talking to her long after this happened. Like, hey, do you know Jesus? Oh, yeah. Nice guy. Nice guy. I'm a big fan of that guy. When's he coming back? Like, you think that in her life she was like, oh, yeah, Jesus, he's, I'm a fan. Or do you think that she would say, oh, my gosh, Jesus, yeah, he saved my life. Like, I was going to be dead. And he came into my life, and I'm alive right now because of him. And so my family, everything I make a decision with my family, it's, it's, it has to do with Jesus. And everything I do with my free time has to be based on Jesus. And everything I do in my work, it's based on Jesus. Like, he's not just a part of my life. He's the heart of my life from now on. In fact, St. Paul in the second reading, he's writing to Timothy. St. Paul was one of these guys who, before he met Jesus, I mean, he was a stellar human being. I mean, he was an incredible guy. He held the law. He was a genius. He was the smartest guy in the room. Here's St. Paul, and he's honest. He's an up-and-comer. He was one of the smartest rabbis who was taught by one of the smartest rabbis. Paul had it all when it came to his life. And then he met Jesus, and he describes it. He says, everything I once held dear, everything I once thought was valuable, he says, I now consider it all rubbish. And now, it's been interesting. That's our cleaned-up English version of what St. Paul actually said. The Greek word that he used, he said, everything I once thought was so important, I consider it now excrement. And St. Paul, that's even a cleaned-up version of what he actually said. St. Paul was a relatively earthy guy, and we have kids here, so we're going to keep it cleaned up. But here's St. Paul. He says, everything, all the stuff that I used to have on my coffee table, it was so important to me. And now, after meeting Jesus, it's just, it's just poo. You know, it's essentially the contents of a dirty diaper. I mean, I know a lot of you probably dealt with dirty diapers in in your day. Imagine this. Imagine having this dirty diaper in your hands, and you're like, here it is. My pride and joy. And you put it on the mantelpiece over the fireplace. You know, visitors come to visit. You're like, hey, wait, let me show you something. This is what I'm all about. I mean, you even have... The guy in the first reading, his name's Abram. You know, he becomes Abraham. And he's got his homeland, and he's got his family, and he's got his work, and he's got his gods. And then the God steps in and says, Abram, I need you to do this. The things you love, I need you to walk away from them. Leave your homeland. Leave your family. Leave your false gods behind. I'm calling you. I love you. Those false gods, they don't love you, but I do. And it says then, the last line in Scripture today says, And then Abraham went as he was directed. He's willing to leave the stuff on his coffee table. Here's my, here's the question. Looking at everything on your coffee table, that is just this morning, all the things that you love, all the things that are important, and they probably are important, they probably are, are worth loving. Here's a question. If all of those were taken away, but you got to keep one, what would it be? Like, like, imagine this. If, if, if everything was stripped away, what's the one thing that you need on your coffee table to say, okay, everything's gone, it's devastating, but I'm okay? What's the one thing you need to stay on your coffee table? What's the one thing you need in your life to say, even if everything else was taken away, it's okay, I'm okay? Like, is, is it your work? You know, that this, this, like, as long as, even if everything else is taken away, as long as I can make a difference in my work, as long as I can keep my job, I, I, I'd be okay. Maybe it's a relationship. Even if everything else was taken away, that if I could have my spouse, if I could have my kids, 
my kids were okay, I, I, then I'd be okay. I, don't, I could lose everything else, but if they were fine, if I still had this person, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be okay. Maybe it's your health. Say, I can lose my job, I can lose my house, I can lose everything, but if I just have my health, then I'll be okay. You know, I, I know that many, many people here this morning, you know what I'm talking about. You've, you've had those things taken away. Many people here this morning, you've had, you've had that job stripped away from you. And you did nothing wrong, just taken away. Many people here, the love of your life, you've had to say goodbye to them. Because they either walked away or they were taken away. I know a few of you have lost your kids. And that's just devastating. You know what I'm talking about. And I know a lot of people here today, you know what it was, you knew what it was like to have health, and now you also know what it's like when that health is gone. You know, none of those things, none of those things are bad. They're all good, actually. The problem is this. The bad thing is when those good things become the ultimate thing. The bad thing is when those good things we have in our lives, that we love, when they become the ultimate thing, they become what you might call a counterfeit God. You know, you can say, you're like, I don't have a counterfeit God. I don't have an idol. I don't have a statue in my house that I, like, light incense in front of. Maybe you do. I don't know. But here's the thing is, an idol is this. An idol is anything that you'd be willing to sacrifice everything in order to have, in order to keep, in order to love, serve, and obey. An idol is anything that you'd be willing to sacrifice everything in order to love or serve and obey. So do you have any of those things in your coffee table? If any of those things in your coffee table become your counterfeit God. A couple of them are this. I imagine the people here this morning that you just realize that maybe you wake up today and realize money has become my counterfeit God. Not because like I'm the wealthiest person, not even because I want to become the wealthiest person in the world. I don't need to be Bill Gates. I just want to have more. (laughs) I don't need to have all the money in the world. I just want to have at least as much as my neighbor or possibly slightly more than my neighbor. And everything I do is for that. Maybe it's, act, maybe it's not just money. Maybe it's success. Maybe it's being important. And a lot of people, they find themselves enslaved by this idea that I need to be important. I need to be a success. Again, I don't need to be the president of the United States. I just want to be seen as having an influence. I'll do everything it takes to become that person. Maybe, maybe your idol, maybe your counterfeit God is being smart. Maybe you've always been like the smartest guy in the room. Or you're like me and your counterfeit God is pretending to be smart. Like you ever do this? I find myself doing this all the time. You ever have a conversation with somebody and you have no idea what they're talking about at all? But you're like, oh yeah, I know totally. (laughs) Uh, Preach it, seriously. Yeah, that Dow Jones, (laughs) it's like a roller coaster, right? And I'm willing to, why do I do this? I'm willing to trade in my honesty in order to appear smarter than I am. It's appearance. That's a counterfeit God too. Appearance. Attractiveness. You know, I noticed this in Minnesota. Almost every town I've ever been in, in in my home state in Minnesota, we have places of 24-hour adoration. I don't know. I think I was driving, Father Tom picked me up from the airport yesterday, and we were driving through towns, and I noticed that a lot of towns here in Texas as well have 24-hour adoration. These buildings of 24-hour adoration, almost every town 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all it takes to get in is you have a little chip attached to your keychain, walk up to the door, morning, noon, night, middle of the night, put the thing, put the little chip against the door, it opens up, and you walk into a room where the walls are lined with mirrors, and the high priests and priestesses are dressed in spandex and leotards, and they tell you to spin faster, and to jump higher, and to lift more weights, and it, here it is, you know, 24-hour fitness, 24-hour adoration of my body. Anytime, morning, noon, or night, you can go and worship. No, that's not to say the body is bad. At all. At all. It's not to say that caring about your health is bad. Not at all. But it's when we take our identity and make our attractiveness or make our health our idol because we got our identity from it. I was talking to a mom. She has two daughters just recently, a little while ago. And the oldest daughter is just beautiful. She's just this gorgeous young woman. And her younger sister is, is nice looking, but she's kind of plain compared to her older sister. 
And her mom was talking to me and saying, like, I just, I'm so worried about the younger sister. I'm so worried about the younger daughter because her older sister is so beautiful. And everyone just loves her so much that I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, the younger daughter is just a little more plain and she's going to have a tough time. And I said, like, I know the whole family. I was like, actually, I'm more concerned about your older daughter because she is beautiful and everyone knows it and she knows it and she's loved in so many ways because she's beautiful. And she can take her identity in her beauty. But someday that beauty will be taken away from her. Even, even if she ages gracefully. In five years, she will no longer be as beautiful as she is now. In ten years, no matter what she does, her beauty will be stripped, her youth will be stripped, it will all go. And if she's wrapped up her identity, if her beauty has become, her attractiveness has become her identity, her idol, her false god, that false god does not love her. And it will leave her. I mean, so many people will trade in their identity, even for like a relationship. How many people are willing to sacrifice everything at the altar of a relationship? They're even willing to break their most solemn promises that they've ever made for the hope of maybe this other relationship. They're willing to turn their back on Jesus for this other relationship. The last one I'm just thinking about is work. I mean, honestly, how many, how many of us, work is our idol. Work is the thing that we think about all of the time. It occupies our heart. It occupies our mind. I was at a men's conference recently up in our diocese, and the guy on the stage, he was talking about, he said, fathers, he's talking to dads, he said, fathers, how many of you have sacrificed your family for the altar, or at the altar of work? He asked, how many dads, how many fathers have sacrificed time with their kids at the altar of their work? And I was sitting next to this guy. This guy's about 70, 71 years old. This man is just, he's worked hard his whole life. He was an orthopedic surgeon. He just retired about two years ago or so. And there were times when he was away from his family for like two weeks at a time. And he was still in the same town, but he was working at the hospital round the clock. He was working super hard. And this, as this guy is saying, fathers, how many times have you sacrificed your family at the altar of your work? This guy was, I could feel him squirm and just was being convicted. So after he got done, I looked to the guy. I said, what are you thinking? And he said, oh man, that just, that stings. And I looked back at him and I said, yeah, but dad, I said, dad, <laughs> you worked really hard, but here's the thing. You taught all of your kids how to work hard. Honestly, Dad, none of your, every one of your kids knows how to work, and we all know how to work really, really hard because you showed us that. And yes, there were some times you sacrificed time with us at the altar of your work or at the altar of your patience. But what if you were to trade that? What if we were to become your idol? Because family can become an idol just as easily as work can become an idol because an idol reduce, will, all an idol does is it enslaves. And it will always, always leave. Because our idols, our idols, they don't love us. They just want us to perform. The idols, the things on my coffee table that I make the center of my life, it just wants us to perform. And in fact, that's the main commandment about every one of these counterfeit gods. Every one of these idols is this. The commandment is this. Thou shalt perform which is basically the commandment of our culture, isn't it? Like this whole notion that, that you have to have the perfect kids who play perfect t-ball or perfect soccer and get perfect grades and behave perfectly at mass and never squirm you, while you have the perfect car that's not too ostentatious but at the same time not junky. And that you have the perfect house that you can afford and yet at the same time take out a 30-year mortgage. And you have the perfect relationship that people praise for its casual elegance and the way in which you finish each other's sentences. Like this, we need this perfection because the commandment of our culture is the commandment of a false god. Thou shalt perform. You have to be perfect. And as long as things go well, it works. Like, as long as you keep succeeding, it's awesome. It works. But what happens when we fail? What happens when we can't perform anymore? What happens when the mask is stripped away? Now, sometimes, sometimes the problem is this. We meet Jesus— we meet the true God, and we think that he wants us to do what the false gods want us to do. And so what we do is we show up at Mass thinking we need to perform. 
We show up praying, thinking that we need to tell God what he wants to hear. We show up and we worship God, thinking that all he wants from us is to offer him our fakeness. Show up with a mask, thou shalt perform. And even though we know that God loves us, we don't believe it. I work with high school students all the time, or college students all of the time, and many of them have been raised to know, to know that God loves them. But most college students I talk to, they don't actually believe that God loves them. They believe that God tolerates them. And I wonder how many people here this morning came to Mass. You you know, like, I know God loves me, but actually what I really think, what I really believe is that God just simply tolerates me. So he's kind of happy that I'm here, put a little check in my box, better than the negative mark I would have gotten if I stayed home. But he just wants me to perform as well. Sometimes we think that. We think that the true God is just like the counterfeit God. But it's crazy because if you read the scriptures again, if you read the Bible, that's never the case. God always breaks into people's lives when they're broken. He breaks into their lives when they have nothing to give him. St. Paul, once again. St. Paul, when Jesus comes into his life, he's on his way. (laughs) He's on his way to capture, torture, and kill Christians. He has nothing to offer God except for his sin. In fact, he says it to Timothy. He says, he says, he saved us not according to our works, not according to our performance, but because of his grace. And God steps in to Paul's life. He realizes, I don't have to perform anymore. These counterfeit gods, they don't love me. Jesus actually does. All these things on my coffee table, they don't love me back. Jesus actually does. Even think about Peter in the transfiguration today. He gets taken up this high mountain, given this incredible gift of seeing the Lord face to face, like revealed in all of his glory. Do you know, do you know what the last words Jesus says to Peter before this scene? He calls him Satan. <laughs> Peter has this, says this stupid thing, and Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And there, the, almost the very next thing is, come up, I want to show you my glory. Not because you're amazing, not because you're perfect, not because you performed, but because I love you for crying out loud. One of my favorite saints of all time is a guy named St. Francis of Assisi. You've probably heard of St. Francis of Assisi. He's somewhat connected to uh, St. Anthony of Padua, so you might have heard of him. But before St. Francis of Assisi was St. Francis, he was just Francis from Assisi. And the guy, he lived for other people's thoughts about him. He lived for a good reputation. St. Francis, back in the day, in Assisi, his house was like the party house. And he lived for people to have fun in his presence. In fact, he cared so much about what people thought of him that he went up to war. He got ready, he got suited up, went off to battle. But while he was in battle, he got sick, he got captured. He got stripped of everything. And he came home broken, empty-handed, with nothing to offer. And that's when Jesus came into his life and said, Yeah, Francis, put to death that counterfeit God, what other people think. Put to death that other counterfeit God of your success of your achievement, of your being great. Let the real God live. And we can look at our coffee tables and we can say, okay, which one is the counterfeit God? We can spend a lot of our lives and drive ourselves crazy trying to track down, hunt down, and kill the counterfeit God. I'm not asking for that because you might identify your spouse as your counterfeit God. (laughs) And there's no, I don't want that to happen. Not (laughs) What we can do instead of looking for the counterfeit, instead of hunting down the counterfeit, is we can look for the real one. You know, the U.S. Treasury, when they train people to spout, spot counterfeit bills, what they don't do is they don't do this. They don't have people come into the U.S. Treasury and then study counterfeit bills all day. You know, they study all the nuances of how it could be counterfeited, all the nuances of how it could be fake, and they don't study the counterfeit all day. What they do do is they bring people into the U.S. Treasury and they show them the real thing. And they study the genuine article. They study the real bill all day long. And they get to know what the real one looks like so thoroughly that every time they see a counterfeit bill, immediately they can spot it. The same is true for us. Same is true for me. Am I, am I studying? The question is, this, am I studying the real God? Or am I paying more attention to my counterfeit gods? Am I looking at... The God who loves me, or am I paying attention to a God who doesn't care about me? Have I spent any time in the last week looking at Jesus alone? Has there been any time that I've looked at Jesus alone? And this is the last thing. 
some of the last words of the gospel today. After the whole thing fades and Moses and Elijah are taken away and the Father's voice, voice fades into heaven, it says that Peter, James, and John, they look up and all they saw there was Jesus alone. So we're a week and a half into Lent. And I, I'm going to invite you to do this, this thing. But this is not just another thing on your plate. It's not just another task to perform. It's not just another thing on your coffee table. But I'm going to invite you to do this. Make a decision before the end of Mass. This is really important. This is the last thing, and this is like, if you forget everything else, just think of this. How much time each day, for the next seven days, until next Sunday, are you going to spend looking at the true God? How many time, in, how much time, pick a number, like a, pick an actual number, are you going to spend each day for the next seven days to look at the God who actually loves you back, to look at Jesus alone? Whether that's by reading about him in the Gospels, or maybe going to adoration, maybe coming to daily Mass, maybe praying your rosary, where you just get to, I just get to contemplate the face of Jesus alone. I want to look at the real God, because a lot of stuff on your coffee table, it's all good. But is Jesus nothing, just another part of your coffee table? Or is he the heart of your coffee table? Is he just another part of your life? Or is he the Lord of your life? So again, please, just my invitation. Pick a number before the end of Mass. How many minutes per day for the next seven days will you just spend time with Jesus so that he can be the Lord of your family and those you love? So that he can be the Lord of your health. So that he can be the Lord of your work. The Lord of your free time. So that Jesus can be not just another part of your coffee table or another part of your life, but, but so that Jesus can be the Lord of your coffee table. So that Jesus can be the Lord of your life. the spirit and the bride say come yeah the spirit and the bride say come